As you can see here, I've accumulated quite a few of these electronic component testers over the years, and this video is for anyone that's interested to know a little about what these are capable of doing and whether they're worth owning. I won't be looking individually at all of these testers, but I'll focus on this one, the LCR TC2. As of all of these, this is the one I find myself actually going back to on a fairly regular basis. These component testers aren't new. Here's the first one I purchased years ago. It cost me less than $10 at the time. And as you can see, with this particular design, there's no fancy plastic casing or internal battery like a lot of the newer versions have. Some of you may be wondering what these are used for, and basically they're capable of testing and identifying a wide range of electronic components. Everything from resistors to diodes, capacitors, inductors, thyristors, xenodiodes, transistors, N and P channel MOSFETs, and this one can even decode infrared signals from a remote control. As you can imagine, these features have a huge appeal to electronics hobbyists who might not want to spend a lot of money on the equivalent bench versions of these tools. It's my understanding that originally these were known as an AVR transistor tester. Uh, it was invented sometime around 2009 by Marcus Freyek, and then sometime around 2012, Karl Heinz Kubler continued the work of Marcus and was able to refine and improve the software, ultimately increasing its accuracy and the number of components that it was able to identify. As far as I'm aware, these two people have never benefited financially from their work on this and are seldom credited, so I think it's only right to acknowledge them here before I jump into some of the details. Okay then, so let's look at the LCRTC2, and as you likely have already guessed, it's a newer version of this unit here, the TC1. You might be wondering why I've got four of these sitting here, and that's because despite their similar appearances, these two on the left are essentially counterfeits of what is already a very cheap product coming out of China. More on that later though. As I mentioned, these can measure capacitance, resistance, and inductance, among other things, and they can automatically recognize components. They can even distinguish between different types of transistors, such as MPN and PNP. You can see it has an LCD display, and the overall interface is very straightforward with a single button to operate the device. It has a micro USB port for charging the internal 3.7 volt battery, and a charging status LED here. If the LED is red, the battery is charging but not fully charged, and green indicates that the battery is fully charged. When the battery drops below a certain threshold, which I believe is typically three volts on these, it will auto shut down. And the battery voltage is also measured during each component measurement and is displayed on the LCD after each measurement. It will say VBAT equals, X amount of volts. The device switches off automatically after 20 seconds of inactivity by default, and you can also turn it off manually by pressing and holding the start button. This will also interrupt and stop any component tests that you might have in progress. Before you jump in and start testing components though, it's important to first calibrate the device. And we do that by performing what's called a self-test. Now, when you buy these, they typically come with one of these and it's provided so you can connect slots one, two, and three, essentially shorting them. And this action is what enables the self-test process when you start up the device. There are quite a few opinions regarding this provided tool. Some say that it can introduce too much parasitic capacitance, which will throw off the accuracy of your measurements. Can't say I've encountered that personally, but I choose not to use it anyway. As I said before, all we need to do is short slots one, two, and three, and there are other ways of doing that. Here are the two methods that I use. First, if I'm going to be using the probes that are often supplied with these testers, it's easy to connect the leads to the slots and then the probes together. Start up the device and you'll note that it launches straight into the self-test mode. Another simple way of doing this is by using small breadboard jumper wires. Simply place one connecting slots one and two and another between two and three. And again, start the device and it will launch into the self-test mode. We then wait for the message stating to isolate the probes. And when you see this, remove the connecting wires and the self-test will recommence on its own. Once the self-test completes successfully, you're ready to start testing components. Now, if you look at the test socket layout where we place components, note that all of the sockets labeled one are interconnected, as are the twos and also the threes. So it's important when placing components with two leads that you connect them from one to two or from one to three, two to three, etc. 
It doesn't really matter which ones you use, just make sure that you don't connect your component to sockets that have the same number. Transistors, which have three leads of course, need to be placed in sockets numbered 1, 2 and 3. Again, it doesn't matter which ones you choose, as long as you use 1, 2 and 3. The test socket area is divided into two main zones. Uh, transistors, diodes, resistors, capacitors, etc. all go into this area with the 1, 2 and 3 sockets. If you're testing a Zener diode though, they need to be tested using these three sockets here. On this one, they are labeled KAA, and these are specifically for measuring the breakdown voltage of Zener diodes, K being for cathode and A for anode. Now, I don't want to bore you with endless component testing, but let's chuck a few components in so you can get a sense of its basic operation. We'll start off with this single resistor. Now I'm placing two resistors. An LED or light emitting diode. And note that it tells you which socket the cathode and the anode are connected to. Now placing two LEDs in random sockets. An electrolytic capacitor. And note here as well we have V loss or voltage loss and ESR or equivalent series resistance, both of which are quite useful for detecting failed electrolytic capacitors. Okay, let's try a transistor. And again, aside from being able to distinguish that this is an MPN transistor, note it tells us the specific sockets that have the collector base and emitter leads. Sometimes it's best to opt to use the probes that are provided if the component leads are too long to fit into the provided sockets. Okay, now let's try a Zener diode. Okay, and let's test the infrared decoder. As you can see, depending on the button that I press, it tells us the user code and the data code associated with that particular button. Some of the earlier versions of these testers were quite limited in terms of supported protocols. This particular model though supports around 15 different protocols. This particular feature of being able to test a battery I don't find particularly useful, but for the sake of completeness I'll show it here. The main thing is the battery cannot exceed 4.5 volts or you may damage the tester. Testing a random MOSFET. And one last test, a thyristor. Now, I mentioned earlier that you can sometimes encounter counterfeit versions of these testers, which are often packaged within identical looking plastic cases. I'll just quickly show a few things to watch out for. Note on this one, the legitimate MCU and AppMega microcontroller and the crystal here. And then if we look at these ones, note there's no crystal and take a look at the MCU. I don't even know if that is an AppMega or something else entirely that's being used. Essentially, they all come out of China, the good ones and the bad ones. I've heard reports of people uh, damaging components using these counterfeit ones and so I guess the caution here as with anything is buyer beware. Try to buy from a reputable source and always check it carefully before putting your trust in it. I've also seen some cases where people have attempted in-circuit measurement and testing of components so 
Another word of caution here is that that can be quite risky, especially when measuring components like capacitors which need to be fully discharged before testing. Any kind of charge or feedback can damage the chip and the internals of the component tester, and if that happens, you're going to have a bad time. I think when you consider the wide-ranging function and capability of these cheap units, it's absolutely worth owning one and having it sitting on your bench. Even if you don't trust them for more serious applications, considering their price point, they're actually just super useful for quick part identification and testing. Another device I haven't touched on in this video, but you may have noticed it at the beginning, is this one. It's an IC tester, a completely different design uh, from the other ones I've just shown, and it's used to test and identify integrated circuits. It does test some other components like transistors as well, but primarily this is for identifying and testing ICs. This one, if I remember correctly, is capable of identifying something like 1400 different integrated circuits, which I think is brilliant. That's probably a bit off topic for today though, and so I might look at making a separate video on that one in the future. That's it for today. Thanks for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, please do click like and subscribe to support the channel.